This episode of Metatrex is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. Want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. There's no greater challenge than the study of philosophy. My philosophy is that there is room for all philosophies on this station. Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 89 of Metatrex, Trek FM show on Star Trek and philosophy. My name is Zachary Frubling, and with me as he always is, is Mike Morrison. Well today, we are going to be discussing the philosophical themes in the unaired pilot episode of Star Trek the Original Series, The Cage. Mike, how are you today? Check the circuit! I'm doing alright, Zachary, thank you. First line of this unaired pilot, The Cage... I have to say, I'm really excited about this. We've talked about the cage in part throughout our, our run here on Metatrex, and we've had some discussion around some of the philosophical themes, but to really drill down into this as a standalone episode and have a conversation that's solely about the cage, we have not done, and I am extremely excited to be able to do that. Well, for a long time, The Cage was an enigma. It was unaired and unseen by, by Star Trek fans. And of course, when The Cage was produced, it was criticized by Paramount as being too cerebral. you know. And, and yet it set mm-hmm. the tone for so much of what Star Trek became. So many of the things we we associate with Star Trek, you know, the transporters and phasers and, you know, the, the, the general um, structure of uh, the command structure of being on the bridge, that kind of thing, were all established in, in the cage. And of course it didn't, it, it excited Paramount enough for them to, you know, uh, give Gene Ruddenberry the chance to make another, <laughs> you know, try again and make it, a, make it a little better. Uh, but I've fallen completely in love with the cage. Um, I like its cerebral nature. I think it's commentary on the human condition and it's commentary on the burdens of command and it's deep probing about what human happiness is really supposed to be um, is a really deep topic for for television in the 1960s. It's no accident, of course, that that, that Gene Roddenberry was asked to retool it. You know, it didn't it didn't really. Um, I would say the television audience of the of the 60s wasn't quite ready for you know, what The Cage was. But I think looking back at The Cage now, it's a brilliant, brilliant episode with so much to say. I'm really looking forward to diving in and talking about it today. It seems that oftentimes when I hear conversations about The Cage and also the original series uh, by extension, a lot of that conversation is around the compromises that Gene Roddenberry made in order to bring Star Trek to the small screen. And a lot of that criticism, I think, is is warranted, certainly. But by and large, I don't think there's enough conversation about the things that Gene Roddenberry didn't compromise. One of the big criticisms, as you said correctly, was that this was a very cerebral science fiction show. And I'm so glad, Zachary, that Gene Roddenberry did not sacrifice the philosophical nature, the the heady nature, this, for lack of a better word, cerebral science fiction show. I'm glad he didn't sacrifice that because so much of what... I think brings people back to Star Trek time and time again is the fact that it is an exploration of the human condition. And I think that certainly the cage is really the pinnacle of of what that's all about. And 
as you said, there are so many things, you know, we can talk about the Orions, we can talk about the Enterprise itself, the 1701, uh, all of these things that are just iconic to Star Trek. Um, they dropped the cage lasers and traded them for phasers. Uh, there were some changes there, but there are so many things that this episode established that became a constant in the Star Trek universe. It can't be ignored. But as we're doling out criticism about the things that were compromised, let us not forget the things that Gene Roddenberry drew the line in the sand about and and went forward regardless of what the executives had to say. I think it's also interesting to look back at the ways in which some of the ideas that became Star Trek and, and the cage here in particular were derived from things that had been on television before. Like I vaguely remember a twilight zone episode where aliens show up and they take humans to put them in a zoo. Mm-hmm. And that's essentially what's going on in the cage. <laughs> the yes. oceans are, they want to keep a couple of human specimens and give them all of the, you know, illusory human pleasures that they would have inside their, uh, inside their cages, essentially, you know, through illusions and, and whatnot. But it's something that wasn't an original idea of Star Trek. It was something that had, um, you know, been seen in, in in television shows like The Twilight Zone that Gene Roddenberry picked up on and found a way to deal with them in a in a in a in a thoughtful, self reflective kind of way that had something to say about those things. It wasn't just pure entertainment. It was commentary. Sure, and but I think Zachary, one of the things that really set Star Trek apart. Yeah, and you're right. Some of these things, I think, were explored to some degree or another in other series, is, and and they've been explored since. I'm I'm a uh, Stargate SG one fan, and and certainly as I'm sitting down oh, watching, yeah, I love Stargate, uh, Battlestar Galactica. It's interesting because as I watch episodes of those shows, I sit there sometimes and I go. Oh, yeah, they totally did that in Star Trek. And oftentimes, I think Star Trek did it better. But, Zachary, what really grabs my attention here about Star Trek and what sets it apart is that up until this time, and again, I know this is a criticism because this was one of those compromises, but we we had a woman in command on the bridge. We had a diverse crew and that diversity also included something very alien in this devil man, as the executives called him, uh, this character Spock. And in fact, they famously, we know, all know the story. They told him to, to get rid of the devil man and the woman in command, because after all, no one's going to believe that even in the future that men are going to take orders from women. You know, so Gene Roddenberry's solution, he married the woman and kept the, the devil man and... Uh, Famously, we, we we have this beloved character who I think represents uh, really in some ways a radical form of diversity in the late 1960s. I think from the very beginning in The Cage, one of the most brilliant things that Gene Roddenberry found a way to do was to use aliens as a way of commenting on the human condition. Mm-hmm. We can look at humanity through Spock's eyes, you know, supposedly more logical, more advanced, superior in some ways, physically superior, mentally superior. Uh, and yet see both human virtues and human failings through Spock's eyes. We get to see the same thing through the eyes of the Telosians. You know, when we take humans and treat them like laboratory rats and put them inside of a cage for study for as, as specimens or as pets to give them everything that, that, that they want, adoration, you know, give them all the illusions of happiness. What does that mean for us and what we want and what's important in our lives? Uh, and I think this is something that just happened from the very beginning throughout Star Trek is using the perspective of aliens as a lens into the human condition, you know, things we can't see about ourselves and we don't even want to admit about ourselves sometimes become totally clear when you put them in outer space with an alien race commenting on us. (laughs) I, I appreciate too, Zachary, the commentary, at least in this episode, that even abhorrent behavior is redeemable. You know, dur- during the course of this episode, there are moments when Captain Pike is is literally strangling the life out of uh, one of these Telosians, and there's a, this great desire, you know, to to kill this 
life form that that has uh, caged him up, and and he's saying so, uh, as much. But at the end of the episode, we see the Telosians are actually capable of compassion, and that compassion is rewarded and it is appreciated and it changes the relationship between Captain Pike and the Telosians at the very end of the episode. And so I think that there's, I think there's a message there that even the worst behavior in society can be redeemable. And who, who, who doesn't want a positive commentary like that about the dark underbelly of our own of our own culture. But at the same time, the Telosians seem to be claiming that most human behavior is is a matter of conditioned responses. Mm-hmm. They 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 say as much in the episode, you know, we can provoke him in this way and look how we, how he reacts. <laughs> you know, we can we can make him angry. <laughs> look. <laughs> and and so much of human nature is like that. You know, we we think we're acting a free will, but really our 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 responses are conditioned either based on past experience or things that have been reinforced in our lives or things that are socially reinforced. Um you know, are we really that much more advanced than lab rats? And I, I, I think this is Gene Roddenberry saying maybe we're not. <laughs> you know, we we think we're we're <laughs> smart and advanced, and yet we have so much so much further to go. And when when you take us and put us in, in a laboratory environment, you know, that's essentially what's going on inside the cage. You see that you know Captain Pike is basically functioning like a laboratory rat. You can give him certain stimuli, and he becomes pacified. You can give him other stimuli, and he becomes angry. And look, we can just treat him like a puppet. <laughs> and, and humans are like that. Humans are manipulable. Um, you know, if you give them the right stimuli, you can provoke certain reactions for positive or for negative. Um, so yeah, humans are redeemable, but they're also very predictable in their responses. It occurs to me that there is another species out there with a very large cranium who seems to have the same commentary about humanity, and that would be the Ferengi. Uh, Quark makes a similar claim in talking to Nog. You take away their hollow suites, take away their creature comforts, and they are capable of the same kinds of terrible things that any Klingon or, you know, any uh, Romulan or, or any Nausicaan is, is capable of. And uh, so I, I find that interesting that uh, there's another species out there that shares that commentary. Oftentimes in future iterations of Star Trek, Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, you get alien races that are commentary, almost, I would call them silent commentary on the human condition. They comment on us not mm-hmm. by commenting on us. They are just different from us. And we can we can take their perspective, but there's not a lot of explicit commentary about human nature sure. in conversations we see with alien races. But uh, and in in the cage with the Telosians, they do. They're explicitly commenting on the human condition because the humans are in their zoo, <laughs> and they're going, "Look at the humans! Look at what we can make them do!" Blah 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 blah. And in Deep Space Nine, the Ferengi serve that role a lot. Quark and Nog basically sit there and they discuss human nature explicitly mm-hmm. <laughs> in a, in a way that's very very similar to what the Telosians do in in the cage. I I'd never really picked up on that. I, it's one of the things I like about the use of the Ferengi in Deep Space Nine. Uh, it's one of the things. Yeah. I like about the Telosians here in the cage. Um, but oftentimes the, the commentary that Star Trek gives is not an explicit commentary in that way. You have to kind of take the perspective of the Klingons or take the perspective of the Romulans, but you don't get a lot of explicit commentary on human nature in Klingon discussions or in Romulan discussions. I, it's an interesting, it's interesting that that's a throwback to, to what we see in, in the cage in, in Deep Space Nine. So that's a great observation. Yeah. The Ferengi, not just for comic relief. <laughs> And then there are alien species out there, Zachary, that just insult us and call us ugly bags of mostly water. We we don't see anything like that here in the cage, but it seems that the Telosians have a very low opinion of humanity. And I think that that opinion is expressed not just in their words, but in their actions. They They capture this human being and they put him in a cage. He is a spectacle. And they are trying to, like a lab rat, stimulate responses from him. And they are openly observing and commenting on his behavior. And, you know, as you watch this, uh, you share 
Captain Pike's disgust with what's being done to him. And uh, I, I think in many ways, this was not exactly the distraction that he was looking for at the beginning of the episode. But it seems that this crisis, this existential crisis that he's having at the beginning of the episode uh, certainly was remedied to some degree uh, by his by his experience. As I was preparing for our discussion today, the two main themes that jumped out to me inside the cage are, first of all, Captain Pike's existential crisis. He feels the weight of responsibility for all the lives under his command. He is tired of making mm-hmm. decisions. He's considering resigning his commission and going off to have picnics back on back on Earth. He's complaining to his doctor. <laughs> um, he's imagining all the different possibilities that he could have for himself. You know, he could go off and live with the Orions and be a slave trader. He could, he's just imagining different ways life could be. And we all do that. Sometimes we get, we get these moments of change where we're like, I'm tired of doing what I'm doing. What else could life be besides this life that I've chosen up and up until now? Um, if there's, it's a classic existential crisis. I'm not happy with where I'm at. What else could life be? Right. But that's deeply related to the second philosophical issue in the cage, which is the meaning of human happiness. You know, what what is an important, valuable, um, satisfying human life? What's the nature of happiness? What's the nature of pleasure? The Telosians basically give him everything that he starts out saying he wants at the beginning of the episode. He wants to be on a picnic mm-hmm. back on Earth, you know, having an easier life, you know, not being in charge, not having responsibility, not having people's lives affected by his decisions every day. And they give him the power to sit in a fake picnic inside their zoo <laughs> and and basically be <laughs> as content as he, as he wants to be. And this episode, I think, makes the really interesting point that there's something deeply dissatisfying about having everything you want given to you. You know, it's not enough to have a picnic. It's not enough to not make decisions. It's not enough to not have to struggle. Um, these things that we think we want in human life, these moments of leisure, right? I don't want to work today. I want to take it mm-hmm. easy. I want to be out on a picnic. I want to go to the beach. I want fill in the blank, whatever you think you want. <laughs> Um, if that were handed to you, you know, if all of a sudden you found yourself in a Telosian zoo and, and, and these things could be real, this episode, I think, makes the really interesting point that you may not be as happy as you think you would be. And I agree with that completely. You you take the con- the conversation that he has with Dr. Boyce uh, at the beginning of the episode, and, and, and really Captain Pike is suffering from a condition that I think a lot of high-functioning executive level performers are suffering from these days. And that's, that's just, you know, they're, they're burnout workaholics. Uh, Dr. Boy says to him, Chris, you set standards for yourself that no one could meet. You treat everyone on board like a human except yourself. And so, so he's burnt out. He's, he's tired. He's tired of carrying uh, the weight of command. And you're right. He thinks he wants pleasure and leisure and picnics back on earth. And, uh, you know, he, he wants to go watch Orion slave girls dance around. It's, it's very, very much like, you know, the guy who says, I just, you know, I just need a vacation. I just want to go to Vegas, see some shows. Do just thinking about gambling. buying a sports car. Buy, yeah. I want to go buy a sports car. Uh, I, 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 you know, I thought about buying a sports car. Did you? <laughs> what what kind of sports car would Zachary <laughs> Fruling buy? While I'm having a midlife crisis? Yes. Um, you know the the sports car I've always wanted. You're gonna laugh. I I want a Knight Rider kit replica car. Awesome. <laughs> if if I was gonna have an existential crisis, like a midlife crisis, and get a sports car, that's the car I would get. Okay. And so, what kind of car? What kind of space car would does Captain Pike want to buy when he gets back to Earth? Yeah, you know that's that's interesting. He and we see in the episode he's he's more of a horse guy. He, you know, skip the car, just yeah, same just give me there. a horse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and and he he does. He literally gets everything he wants. And I think what he realizes at the end of the day is that he is who he is. That very much like some, the other captains that we get in Star Trek, his 
um, you know, his his replacement, Captain Kirk and and Captain Picard and Captain Sisko and Captain Janeway and even the captains that we got in Discovery, I think all have come to terms with the same reality. And that is that that chair really does define who they are. And that is really the only place, you know, and unfortunately for Captain Kirk, it took a promotion to Admiral for him to realize that that chair was where he belonged. As I think about the burden that Captain Pike is feeling, the weight of command and and the burden of having so many people's lives affected by his decisions, it reminds me of the French philosopher, the existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, who claimed that that having free will conveys a a type of existential angst. You know, we feel the weight of our of our own decisions on on our shoulders, and and humans react in that to a number of different ways. Some humans embrace it. Um, some humans become reckless, and they become you know they take free will and you know take it to eleven, <laughs> and then they become they become uh, you know the, you know going going warp eight with their hair on fire. Um, other humans try to ignore the fact they have free will. You know, they pre- they pretend they're constrained by their their circumstances, or mm-hmm. they can't do anything about the situation they're in, or they want to run and hide from it. Right? And I think, and I think Captain Pike is in run and hide from it mode. He can't deal with the weight of, of responsibility anymore. And and all of free will is like that. You know, every time we decide to go left versus go right, you know, choose this career or that choose or choose that career, be in a relationship with this person or be in a relationship with that person. Whether it's study this or study that, whether it's join Starfleet or have a picnic, you know the we the the weight of the future consequences is entirely on your own shoulders at that point. And the interesting thing about the consequences is that they're unpredictable, right? Every decision that Captain Pike makes can lead to any number of unpredictable consequences that he could not have foreseen sitting there in the captain chair. Every time he sends someone on a landing party, something bad could happen and someone could die every single time, day in, day out. And that's the life that he has to live with. And um, I think he, he, he doesn't, He's not ignoring the fact that that the weight of those consequences is on his shoulders. He's just tired from bearing the burden of it every day. Uh, he's probably seen people sure. who've been killed. Uh, you know, presume if we backed up the the reel a little bit and saw Captain Pike a, a week or a month before, probably he sent someone on a landing party and someone had just died, and he's really really depressed about it. Um, and he is just tired of of dealing with the responsibility. But I think he he realizes that he does have that responsibility, and those consequences are on his own shoulders. I think sometimes we humans Humans don't even forget that we have free will and that we we do have the weight of, of future consequences on our own shoulders and people can ignore it. He just is tired and wants to run away from it and go go find a safe place to hide. Well, three cheers for Star Trek Discovery because I think we're going to get some of that backstory. We are going to get to uh, roll the tape back a little bit and see <laughs> what has what took has long brought. Enough. Yeah, it took them long enough. It just you know. 52 years, you know? 50 some years. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to, we're going to get to go back and I think see some of the circumstances that produced the Christopher Pike that we got to see in this pilot episode. I think it's fascinating, Zachary, that we see a couple of extremes here. We see a Captain Pike who is weary of his, his own free will. And then we take that free will away from him. We really put him in a situation where uh, he doesn't have a choice. Life is happening to him, and there's not a not a darn thing he can do about it. And I, I think it almost wakes him up to the reality that his his free will, his personal agency, really is a gift. It is something that he can. Uh, appreciate once again. I think Star Trek from the cage onward all the way through every iteration of Star Trek has had this basic perspective on uh, the burdens of command and the burdens of of human free will and and consequences. Whenever we make choices, any number of things can happen. Some of them are going to be good and some of them are going to be bad. You can't always foresee what those consequences are. Every time Captain Pike sends someone down to a planet, someone might die and that's probably happened a bunch of times and that's why he's feeling the burdens of 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 command 
but it's really important not to quit, <laughs> right? It's important to get beam back up to the ship and it's important to get back in the, in the captain's chair and, you know, set course to wherever and find the next adventure um, and, and not, and not call it quits, not tuck tail and run back to earth. Star Trek is always about pushing forward, pushing forward through the crises, through the political upheaval, through the deaths of, of people you, you work with, whatever the bad consequences are, are, it's really important to pick yourself back up and keep going forward. It's such an important lesson in life. You know, every time we make a decision, you don't know what the consequences are going to be. I've made decisions that have led to bad consequences. So, so have you, but I try my very best to pick myself back up and keep looking forward no matter what what's happened. And it's and I've known people that that can't do that. You know, I've had I've had friends that have committed suicide, you know, and I don't know why. You know, they lost their ability to keep looking looking forward. Mm-hmm. Um and I don't know what happened in their minds to make that that the case. I can imagine Captain Pike going back to Earth and being kind of suicidal, you know. <laughs> I don't see any future. I look at all the, you know, deaths of all these people that I've caused. There's no meaning, you know, an existential crisis like that can lead you to a very, very dark place if you let it. It's really important to pick yourself back up and say, what's happening tomorrow? You know, I, I can't do anything about the deaths of the of the people that are already gone. I can't do anything about these bad consequences. What I can do is get back in the chair and warp to wherever and, and, and fulfill my missions and go on another adventure and embrace the idea that there are future possibilities that could be amazing. Sure. And Captain Pike says to Dr. Boyce in the episode, when Dr. Boyce is talking to him about, you know, taking care of himself mentally, uh, Captain Pike says to him, you either live life, bruises, skin, knees and all, or you turn your back on it and you start dying. And so I think he has an understanding that there's something inherently healthy in his own existential crisis it's a moment for him to to pause and reflect but i i I don't think that he's come to a point uh not in his he may be saying the words i've said the words before you've probably said the words you you've probably had a day at work i know i have where you know you just throw your hands up in the air and you say it's not worth it I I, i quit and you know what? You still get up in the morning when the alarm goes off and you still go and you do your job. Uh, even though the day before you were ready to throw in the towel, you still get up and you go and you do your job. Uh, because you have resigned to the reality that if you turn your back on living life, bruises, skin, knees and all, then inherently you're going to start dying. I am of two minds about this. On the one hand, I feel like Captain Pike is not realistically going to quit, right? He's not going to go become an Orion slave trader. <laughs> that that's he he might tell himself that, but he's not really going to do that. But some people do. Some people walk into work one day and go, "I quit. <laughs> I'm taking the fish and I'm leaving." Like in Jerry Maguire. Right? <laughs> Some people do that. And in a way, I pity them because they those are the people that don't stick it out through the tough times. You know, they don't see the joys and the um, satisfaction of working through hard times. On the other hand, I kind of admire them. You know, I, there's a certain strength involved in not playing it safe and going, I don't know what the future is going to be, but I'm not happy right now. And I'm going to do something radically yeah. different for the sake of of being happier or fill in the blank, whatever the reason is for the radical change. Um I guess I'm of two minds, you know, there's something, there's something virtuous about both of those approaches. And it's not obvious at all, which one is the right thing to do in any given circumstance. But Captain Pike, interestingly enough, once he has, once he has lost his ability to choose his path, even though he's being handed the things that he thinks he wants, he finds something very unpleasant and very distasteful about having to just go with the flow and experience life as it comes and and losing his ability his own personal agency to to make choices for himself and the keeper the telosian keeper says to him that the human race quote shows a unique hatred of captivity even when it's pleasant and benevolent you prefer death this makes you too violent and dangerous a species for our needs. Uh, so, so the Talosians haven't given up on what their needs are, but they at least recognize that a human being possesses the need to choose for himself. The reality is there, there is 
an essence of life that unfolds around us that we can't do anything about. I can't, I can't change what the weather's going to be tomorrow. Uh, I live in Dallas, Texas. It's going to be hot tomorrow, and there's not a darn thing I can do about it. You could jump in your car and go somewhere else. <laughs> I can, I can, I can go back to earth and ride a horse and have a picnic. <laughs> yeah. I went, I went to Las Vegas last week, Zachary, and it was 102 degrees. It was, it, it was Texas, but drier. <laughs> Are you in danger of quitting your job and going to the beach? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I, I don't care for the beach, but, uh, you know, uh, some cool mountains that would, that would be, that would be pleasant. I, I would, I would take that. It seems clear to me, and I'm curious whether you agree with this take on things, that the cage is making the claim that there are things that are more important than happiness. Definitely more important than pure pleasure, but I'd say even more important than than happiness. It's, you know, on the one hand, Pike could have everything he wants inside the Telosian Zoo. You know, he has an attractive woman, he's got horses to ride, he's got a picnic, he's got whatever he wants. He wants adventure, he can go rescue the princess, right? Mm -hmm. He gets to play, he gets to act out a Super Mario Brothers fantasy and go rescue the princess, (laughs) for goodness sakes. I know, whatever it is, he can have it inside the Telosian Zoo, and yet there's no freedom there, there's no choice um I, there's some degree of choice he can choose what he wants what pleasures he wants to experience right it's not that he has no choice i think they're they're probably happy to feed him whatever stimuli he thinks he you know thinks and says he wants so it's not even a matter of choice but it seems clear that there's like a hierarchy of of, of human values here there's there's pleasure and happiness and then there is choice but then there's also responsibility and risk taking and and some of those are just more important than others. Um, you know, happiness without those other things, without without free will and without without genuine risk, uh, and by extension, genuine reward, is not is not truly satisfying. So there are things that are more important than happiness, which is somewhat at odds with our American values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? <laughs> um, it's like having well, maybe not. It's like having happiness without liberty. Right? Yeah. Um, it's life, liberty, and happiness. <laughs> and in in the Telosian Zoo, you might have one without the other. It's interesting, Zachary, because we we see the same dilemma, the same question being asked in other episodes of Star Trek. Uh, for instance, we have we have Barkley in Next Generation who becomes addicted to the Hollow Suite. We have Nog. Oh, yeah. Three Musketeers for days. Yeah, we have we have Nog who is dealing with uh, PTSD. His drug of choice is this fantasy world of you know Reno in 1960. Uh, so we 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 see this happening in other episodes of Star Trek, Vina makes an interesting statement in The Cage. She likens this to a narcotic. She says, because when dreams become more important than reality, you give up travel, building, creating, and quote. I, I find that rather interesting that it's important, I think, for people to dream dreams. And there's a lot of commentary in this about man and his dreams. I mean, after all, Gene Roddenberry had a dream. He had a vision of of a future. And famously, you know, he told Jonathan Frakes, you know, he, in the future, the, you know, there wouldn't be hunger, there wouldn't be poverty. And, and that was his dream of the future. It was this, this utopian view of mankind all grown up taking his place out there in the universe. And we all applaud his dream. I mean, we're all fans of Star Trek, but dreams can also be destructive. There's a lot of commentary in here in this episode about dreams. Uh, For instance, the Keeper says that uh, humans are a curious species. Quote, they have fantasies they hide even from themselves. End quote. Uh, Venus says a person's strongest dreams are about what he can't do, and end quote. And I, I find that fascinating because our dreams, I say to my wife all the time, don't mess with my dreams. They got us to where we are. 
I think it's unquestionable that we don't achieve anything without dreams. Dreams are what force us to challenge ourselves, to envision reality in a way different than, than how it is, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully a better way. But dreams can also be debilitating. And I think that happens when you make the move from having a dream to being a dreamer. Yeah. <laughs> right? There's dreamer in the negative sense where you're so focused on your dreams, you lose touch with reality. You lose touch with the struggle it takes to bring those dreams into reality. You don't challenge yourself. You use dreams and by extension, the holodeck or the Telosian Zoo in, sure. in Star Trek as a form of escape from either taking responsibility or from the hard work it takes to bring dreams into fruition. You know, I would say it's good to have dreams, but it's not always so good to be a dreamer in that negative sense. Sure. And I think where we find Captain Pike at the beginning of this episode, I think we find him tired and he is focused solely on what he dreams of doing. He dreams of going on picnics. He, he dreams of rescuing the princess. He dreams of insert whatever. And when he gets to live out those dreams and those dreams become more, I think, I think what Venus said actually comes to pass. Those dreams become more important than reality. Um, you know, he recognizes that that is not a positive thing. As you were mentioning the holodeck and later iterations of Star Trek, um, I was thinking particularly in, in the beginning of Star Trek The Next Generation when the idea of the holodeck is, is introduced, how much Gene Roddenberry continued to think about the human condition from the perspective of being able to have everything you want. It's such an interesting plot device to be able to give people what they think they want and look at all the bad things that happen to them when they have everything they want, <laughs> they think they want. Um, you know, I think humans are, we're so bad at recognizing what's really good for us and what is really healthy for us and what would really be satisfying. You know, all the things we list off of that we say we think we want may not get us there. And yet we do have dreams. We do, you know, want to better our lives or achieve certain things or have certain things. And, and that's an important part of life too. But um, it might just be a question of having balance. Is is it is it more like an Aristotelian question of just having balance, you know, having some pleasure but not too much pleasure, working hard but not working too hard? Is this episode kind of um, maybe giving a very subtle commentary on, on, on the dangers of excess, having too much pleasure, too much happiness, too much responsibility, too much whatever, trying to find a healthy middle ground? You could, I think you could, it might be a stretch, but you could characterize it in those terms, but Certainly, the Telosian Zoo plays with that question of, of giving someone everything they think they want. The holodeck, we see that countless times in, in Star Trek. We also see it in Star Trek Generations, um, and the idea of the Nexus is another iteration of this basic idea. Absolutely. You know, some, some plot device for giving you things you think you want, you know, it's important to leave the Nexus. It's important to step out of the holodeck. It's important to struggle to get outside of the zoo. Um, that's a consistent message across all of Star Trek. We also get it uh, in Deep Space Nine with Risa. Uh, in fact, you know the, that famous episode of, of Deep Space Nine, where there, there, humanity is being challenged as a species for being addicted to pleasure and not prepared for the reality and the hardships of a war with the Dominion, because you know we we just have bathed ourselves in in the pleasures of our existence. We all have a hedonistic side that kind of just wants to stay on Ryza, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, in reality, who doesn't, who doesn't want to go spend time on a pleasure planet? You know, who wouldn't want to go to a paradise and, and enjoy the sights and sounds and the relaxation and, get a massage if you want a massage you can you can go gliding if you want to go gliding you you're so good at euphemism mountain. mike if you want to climb a it you you can do whatever euphemism you is not do. lost on you no it's not <laughs> but too much of a good thing can be a bad thing it's interesting to me how our cultural perspective on these things have changed. In some ways, we've gotten more conservative. We tend to blush a little easier these things than probably they even did in, in the 60s. You know, this is 1966, and inside the cage, which never aired, of course, but it's, let's assume it had aired, there's a line inside the Orion scene, inside the Telosian Zoo, where an Orion, in talking about the Orion slave women, says to Captain Pike, wouldn't you say it was worth a man's soul? This is a very, very interesting question to ask for 1966 inside Star Trek. You know, take all the pleasures, including the pleasures of the Orion women here on screen. Let's not mince words about it. And ask, wouldn't you say that's worth a man's soul? What an interesting, what an interesting hedonistic question that is to ask. 
So I'm going to go out on a limb. And I think that some of the things that you see inside the cage stem directly from Gene Roddenberry's personal demons. I think that's an arguable truth. The issue of whether an attractive woman, like an Orion slave woman, you know, this is a plot device. This is a construct that he came up with, right? <laughs> is that worth a man's soul? You know, is that is that worth all of the consequences, all of the danger to yourself, all of the whatever? You know, is it worth it? It's, a, it's an important question for, you know, a lot of us to ask. I would say the character of Vina is also an interesting construct of Gene Roddenberry's mind. You know, as I experience this as I get a little older. As I get a little older, as you get a little older, as Gene Roddenberry gets a little older, you know, not in our 20s, we're in our 40s and 50s now. I long for the pleasures of youth. Do you find yourself longing for the pleasures of youth? Vina finds herself longing for the pleasures of youth. She finds herself longing to be young again, have a you know, youngish Captain, attractive Captain Pike, you know, as her as her lifelong, you know, pleasure companion inside the Telosian Zoo. Um, I find myself relating to that. I think Gene Roddenberry came up with it because he was probably feeling that at a certain point. I think you probably relate to that. Oh, sure. At 47 years old, what a, you know, what I what I wouldn't give to be 25 again or 21 again or sure. Absolutely. I can relate. So, I can relate to that. And, and for that matter, I, th I think that Gene famously liked his pleasures in life. And I'll, I'll just sort of leave it to leave it at that. Uh, I, and that's I, so why I think, think you're right. These, th this probably is a representation of his own personal struggles. Yeah. I, I, I really have come to think that the philosophy aside, these are important human questions that we all have to ask about the meaning of life. What kinds of trade-offs are we willing to make? What kinds of pleasures do we find satisfying? What kind of risk do we do to ourselves to achieve whatever we think we want? What is worth struggling for? You know, what do we, or what do we trade our free will for? Um, you know, these aren't philosophy per se, but they're important human questions. They're important questions of the meaning of life and the meaning of happiness and the meaning of pleasure. And I find those questions more interesting the older I get, more relevant to the question of the meaning meaning of life. Um, philosophically in some sense, but more maybe more psychologically and more more uh, personally. But I think of the cage and some the way these questions were dealt with throughout the first couple of seasons of Star Trek and maybe in the early parts of Star Trek The Next Generation as well as a way for Gene Roddenberry to ask questions about himself <laughs> that are and and have and have aliens comment on them <laughs> and sort of re reason through the things that he was thinking about or I wouldn't say struggling with because I didn't know the man but presumably it was some sort of internal mental or emotional struggle um this is a way of acting out the internal mental drama of those things. Yeah. I think that's I think that's correct Zachary and I I'll, I'll take it one step further and say I think that's true of most artists. I think at the end of the day most artists really do leave a piece of themselves in their artwork. I think that if you look at a painter I think oftentimes the subject of their painting really represents their own struggles, their own questions. I think that's true for songwriters, and I can certainly say for myself that it's true in my own writing. I, I dabble a little bit with art, and uh, let's face it, I, I draw the things that interest me, I draw the things that puzzle me, so I think that's very true for Gene Roddenberry, and I think it's true for the other writers who have all had the pleasure of sitting down, you know, pen Star Trek scripts uh, or write books. And maybe this is a question for someone like a, a Dayton Ward or uh, a DC Fontana, and yes, I put them in the same sentence. I, I think those... The, those are the kinds of questions that if I had the opportunity to sit down with one of those individuals, I would probably write or probably ask and say, you know, how much of your own uh, questions, how much of your own struggles uh, did you put into the pages of Star Trek? 
This is why I think Star Trek is Shakespearean in its scope and in its significance. Like Shakespeare asks us, you know, to be or not to Great be. Point. You know, that that's the question. You know, here we have Gene Roddenberry doing a very Shakespearean thing, saying, hmm, to have an Orion woman or not have an Orion woman? That is the question. <laughs> do I want a you know, an exotic woman from another planet, or do I want a picnic with a with a cute blonde? Yeah, and he, he's well. He's doing this through the through the voice of Christopher Pike. He's saying, "Do I do I stay on the ship or do I quit? Do I ride a horse or do I you know send people on an away mission? Do I have an Orion slave woman or do I fill in the blank? Right, whatever it is, um, this is a mouthpiece for this this internal you know dialogue we have about our own free will and what and what we want out of life. Another piece of evidence for my claim that the cage is basically Gene Roddenberry's personal m- mental and emotional struggle turned into it into a stage play is this discussion about which woman Captain Pike is going to choose in becoming the new Adam and Eve. I thought that was fascinating as well, and I'm glad you brought that up. It was in, in my notes. Like now, what now purpose he's being does given this serve? A when they are breaking down the attributes, one of them was young and pretty one of them was smart and experienced and for that matter i think we see something really interesting about the women themselves number one in particular i think struggled with balancing her femininity with being a woman in command i think the uh the yeoman probably had probably nothing that Telosian points out as much that she has feelings that, uh, you know, while she's attracted to Captain Pike, he's rather unattainable for her uh, because she's not intellectual enough or, you know, whatever. Um, I, I think that's exactly what's happening in the episode. The, the pretty one or the smart one. But why is it in the episode? You know, what philosophical role does it serve or what role does it serve in my claim that this is a matter of Gene Roddenberry acting out his own his own mental dialogue? <laughs> it, it, it on the surface seems very random, but I make only the connection that Christopher Pike is being given his first real choice in this scenario. It's almost as though the Telosians are saying, listen, you play ball with us and we'll give you a little freedom. Here, pick a mate. I, I, I think Moran that's jumped what's down, going Al on. Al Moraine jumped down the path? <laughs> <laughs> this is his Al Moraine moment? <laughs> Even though this discussion is a little bit stylized, right? Having to choose between two you know, somewhat different women and becoming the new Adam and Eve to propagate, um, you know, some sort of uh, constrained or imprisoned, uh, you know, population of uh, of mankind here in the Telosian Zoo. In a way, life is like that. You know, when you when you decide who you want to be with, have children with, whatever, you are propagating the human species. <laughs> like, what you know, what when you choose one person or another, you're going to have different children than you would have one way or the other, and you know that has long term consequences that we don't tend to think about. You know, we tend to just live life in the moment. I don't think most people dwell on these things very much, but um, there is something sort of metaphorical about this. You know, when you when you make choices like that, like who you're going to be with, you know. Um, where you're going to live, these sort of important life questions, what you're going to study. Do I study this, study that? Do I marry this person or marry that person? Do I, you know, whatever it is, you know, choose this career, choose that career. You are serving to make the future. And here we kind of see a stylized microcosm of that. You know, do you mm-hmm. choose do you choose this woman or do you choose that woman? You know, choose your descent. Uh, the, one of the Telosians says your children with, with, with this one will be intelli- highly intelligent. <laughs> if you choose yeah. this one, they're going to be pretty, you know. <laughs> um, you know, we do make those choices. We don't like to admit that we make those choices, but we do. We, we we certainly do, and the Telosians have a very dark purpose here. They're they're trying to propagate a slave race, and they're going to use Captain Pike and and his chosen mate to do that. And it's interesting that the Telosians give Captain Pike that kind of power. 
I, I find that fascinating because if they are trying to breed a race of slaves, you would think that there are certain qualities that they would be looking for. Uh, certainly, I can't imagine that they would want, uh, uh, you know, number one, uh, you know, that strong. Don't say bad things about number one. No, you know, my my. My point is, number one really represents a a strong-minded, intelligent uh, woman who is uh, who is capable and and able-bodied and able-minded. And I can't imagine that they would want a slave race who is strong enough and smart enough to just say no. But the Telosians have already admitted that they think they can control human reactions through stimuli. I think they probably sure. just think that humans are controllable, that, you know, yes, okay, if you have, uh, you know, a, a, a slave race that has these qualities where they're intelligent enough to say, no, I don't want to do this anymore and have an uprising, they can feed them enough artificial stimuli or manipulate them in certain ways to to continue to pacify them. The Telosians just seem to, seem to take that almost naive um, uh, perspective on on human nature that way. I think it's that, interesting. I think they're trying to pacify Pike for sure. I mean, it, it, they say as much. You know, well, since you're resisting the present specimen, you now have a selection. And here you go. <laughs> he, each of these women have qualities in their favor. Choose. <laughs> and again, I think it goes back to this idea that I, I think they're saying to Pike. You know, listen. If you play ball, if you if you would just um, settle into your captivity and accept your circumstances, you know, we'll we'll try to make things reasonably pleasant for you. I, th- I think I mean, it's a I think it's a form of reward. It's a, it sounds more to me. It sounds like a Faustian bargain, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think it does. You know, doing doing a deal with your metaphorical devil. I yeah I. I I couldn't if agree you, with you more. If if you work for me, I'll give you what you want. You know, twirl the mustache. Yeah, I, I I agree. Do you think that this episode is strongly criticizing those sort of hedonistic pleasures as being inherently Faustian? That when you choose to have a picnic and ride a horse instead of staying on the ship, that you've done a deal with the devil. When you choose to be with the Orion slave woman, you've done a deal with the devil. When you choose woman A, B, or C... <laughs> you know, as as handed to you by the Telosians, you're doing a deal with the devil, metaphorically. You know, I think you could plausibly say that each kind of um, simpler pleasure that, that Captain Pike is presented with is a kind of trade-off. And explicitly, it's called by the Orion as being potentially worth Captain Pike's soul. Certainly the way it's being presented in this episode, I, I think it is. I think it is a deal with the devil. I think there is something very Faustian about it. However, given the fact that we make these trade-offs in our everyday life from time to time, for instance, you know, I I go on vacation. I really can be working and perhaps even should be working. However, it's also important for my own mental and physical health to get away and change my scenery and take in a little pleasure, uh, see some sights and do some things with my family, spend time uh, with my family. I, there's there's something very healthy about that. But within the story that, that we're presented here, it is a proverbial deal with the devil. But I don't think we're talking about Faustian trips to the beach. No. <laughs> right? Faustian vacations aren't exactly what we're worried about here, right? We're worried about some sort of deeper crisis of the soul than, than you know, taking a two-week vacation. Yeah, we're not going to go on a Faustian horseback ride, no. <laughs> the episode does seem to be saying that not if you take a vacation, but if you make that your full-time move, right? If you if you quit your job to ride a horse and take a picnic, if you um, you know run off to join the Orion, Orion slave traders, if you live the rest of your life in the the, the seemingly pleasure Telosian Zoo, not as a vacation, but as a, a more of a permanent trade-off, then then you've you've put yourself in jeopardy in some way. 
Yeah, for for Captain, we've lost something at least, with, without a doubt. For Captain Pike, you know, even though they're going out of their way, the Telosians are going out of their way to give him what he wants. He's he's come to a point where he realizes that he is Captain Christopher Pike captain of the enterprise he is a starfleet officer that is who he is and for him to be anything else a husband a father uh someone who takes horseback rides in the country and rescues the princess picnics under and rescuing the anything else is just not christopher pike being who he's meant to be And so for him to trade who he is meant to be for anything else would be a tragedy. It wouldn't be living life at all. So up until now, we've been saying that free will is an important part of the human condition, something not to be eliminated. You know, you don't want to live your life in a zoo. It almost sounds to me, though, like you're backing off from that position, saying that, well, there's this kind of destiny of who you are right captain pike is meant to be captain pike he's not meant to go off and you know run with the orions he's not meant to sit and ride a horse all day he's meant to be captain pike on the bridge of the starship um does that take away from the importance of free will in making those decisions i don't think necessarily i i think that uh, it's interesting I, let me let me say this i have been of recent really working through some personality and strengths tests, strengths finder, disc assessments. I've been kind of going through this. Phrenology exam. For, for, for work, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So going through these, I'm really kind of discovering how I'm hardwired and what makes me unique as an individual. I'm discovering my own personal strengths, and I am learning about how my personality And my talents, in many ways, inform the direction that I should go in to really be the best version of myself, to really discover out there what makes me happy, what makes me tick, to find harmony and uh, tranquility in life through being the best version of who I'm hardwired to be. And I, 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 I can't imagine that there's anyone out there that would argue that people have particular strengths and talents and unique personalities, and those traits really make them, in many ways, more suitable for some things in life than others. I don't think we would take someone who is inherently uh, indecisive and put them on the bridge of the Enterprise and tell them, all right, Captain, it's your ship. Uh, (laughs) Likewise, I think what Captain Pike is discovering here in this cage is that he is who he is and where he is the very best version of himself is sitting on the bridge of the Enterprise. Now, that's not to say that he shouldn't, uh, you know, get away once in a while and, uh, you know, go spend some time on Ryza. But in order for him to really be fulfilled in life, the place where he is most alive is sitting on that chair on the bridge of the 1701. I know we're talking about the cage, and because we're talking about the cage, we're not spending much time talking about other things in Star Trek. But one of the things that I I like about the movie Star Trek Nemesis is the very, very end of the movie when they're fixing the Enterprise. Like, all this Mm -hmm. bad stuff has happened. Data's been lost. And at the end of the movie, they're putting the ship back together. And, you know, they don't even show it kind of warping off. They just show them fixing the ship. Like we're getting ready to go back on the journey. I think it's such an interesting, powerful moment that stems all the way back from this Captain Pike moment of it's important to be on the bridge going forward. And that's more important than all these other, you know, directions you could go in life, all these other stimuli, all these other pleasures. The forward momentum of life matters more than any of those things. 
Yeah, and and for Captain Pike, it's not taking away his his personal agency to put him where in many ways he belongs because he could he could go do any number of things out there in the private sector <laughs> but <laughs> private sector <laughs> yeah cuz he wouldn't be in starfleet he'd, he'd be out there in the, in the private sector he could he could do any number of things he could take the skills and talents and gifts that make him an excellent captain and probably go run uh, any any corporation on any planet anywhere in the galaxy and and be successful. No, I, I think he would actually be more like a middle manager <laughs> because the captains aren't the top brass, right? They're not the admirals. They're they're the middle managers of of Starfleet. This much is true, but really, in many ways, they're CEOs of their own little ships. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you picture Captain Pike as an associate director of something at some 24th century space corporation? Yeah, I'm so reminded of Captain Jellico when he looked at Captain Picard and said, make no mistake, the Enterprise is mine now. (laughs) I'm the CEO of the Enterprise 1701D. Go go die for the for the Federation. (laughs) One of the things that jumped out at me when I rewatched The Cage before we recorded is the fact that the Telosians went underground because of war. And it reminded me of H.G. Wells and the Time Machine, you know, the Morlocks going underground or the Eloy being being above ground with their big brains and and uh, kind of weakened physical mm-hmm. nature. The Telosians almost remind me more of the Eloy, even though they, they supposedly went went underground. It's also a commentary on the dangers of war being in the middle of the of the Cold War era. I think you could plausibly say that the cage could be interpreted as a sort of social commentary against the dangers of war in the in the Cold War era. You know, we don't want to turn into the Telosians. Yeah, I think that's fair. You mentioned the Cold War era, you know, and we were this would have been the early to mid 1960s at this point and you know, Vietnam was was unfolding and and we had just kind of come off the Korean War and the Cold War was going on. We're we're in an era here in the in the mid nineteen sixties where wars and rumors of war and fear of war this was a this was a reality in the United States and certainly throughout the world. And I think there's something I think there's a I think there's a subtle commentary here, Zachary, about what that could possibly lead to in the future. You know, we have a society that really in many ways, they, they destroyed themselves. Uh, they, they literally blew themselves up and they were forced to go underground and, you know, look, now they can't even, you know, reemerge on the surface and, and rebuild society. They've got to breed a slave race to do it. And so I, I think there is definitely a subtle commentary there about the dangers of this continual pursuit of of war and conflict. And this is something I think our perspective has changed on. I don't spend my days worrying about World War III. I don't know if you do. I doubt you do. No, I think not really. Most of us probably don't at this point. You know, this is the post-Cold War era. So I'm not sure these issues ring to us younger folks like they, they would have in the mid-1960s for people who were, who were aware enough to realize or think that World War III was a real possibility at that point. There's certainly, there's certainly a lot of conflict in the world and... You know, sure. Uh, you know, I'm I'm probably like many people. I I watch the news and I see things that concern me. I think in many r- ways we've become desensitized, and there's certainly plenty of conflict in the world. I I just I think it's a different world that we live in. Yeah, as we've been talking about the cage, I have been emphasizing the kind of personal existential aspects of the cage, the burdens of choice and command that Captain Pike feels, the questions of personal happiness and personal satisfaction and personal pleasures and the meaning of life from a personal standpoint. And that's a huge part of the cage. But I think we'd be remiss if we didn't also characterize the cage as being a commentary on the Cold War era itself and the dangers of war. That's just as much a part of the episode as either of those other two aspects. It doesn't ring as much to us now as, as it would have in the 60s, but uh, it's, it's there nonetheless. I somewhat disagree with that statement because I, I, think it, I think it 
does ring with us today. I, I think it's I think it's a reminder because, I, I, as I said, I think oftentimes it's not that there's not conflict in the world. There's plenty of it. Uh, and there's as much danger, I think, today of nuclear warfare and the possibility of uh, destroying our planet, I think, is just as real today as it was you know, in the, in the early to mid-1960s. I think we have become very desensitized. And so I think one of the things, Zachary, that really um, has allowed Star Trek to endure uh, for 52 years is the fact that it does provide that commentary and it does remind us that listen if 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 we don't choose a better path you know this could be the result and and i i think that if you stop for a moment and you look at what has become what the telosians have evolved into and what has become of their great society these are clearly an advanced species uh, that that we have here, and they've evolved and 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 mentally, but you know, physically, they they're they're unable. They they lack they lack the drive. They lack the strength, the physical strength. They're certainly knowledgeable enough, but you know, all of the knowledge in the world isn't isn't going to build a city. And I, I think it's a I, th- I think it's a clear reminder that in a world full of conflict, we have to we have to stop and ask ourselves where in the heck is this going, and what do we do to stop it? Yeah, I think this is the most important thing to realize about the Telosians, and maybe about Star Trek in general, but explicitly about the about the Telosians. That every time we see an alien race in Star Trek, that is a mirror for ourselves. Yes. And with the Telosians, the Telosians are not just aliens who are antagonists. They are one possible future of human evolution in the Cold War era. So they're a way for Gene Roddenberry to say, if we're not careful, we could turn into these people. They're not just antagonists. They are potentially ourselves. Yes. And I think it's easy to miss that kind of thing on a, on a casual viewing of, of Star Trek. And, and and even about the cage, you might not think about the Telosians as being a possible future human evolution. But, you know, if if they turned into what they became as a result of war, you know, back in 1966, we're in the middle of the Cold War era here. Like you correctly mentioned, we have the ability to, you know, put ourselves into an into a nuclear winter at the push of a button. Um that is a potential future for us. You know, this is a warning not to become like the Telosians in our in our human um, fragility and in our human uh, lack of forethought. Yes, I, th- I think both both in terms of the writing and I think visually what they gave us on the screen. I think Gene Roddenberry is clearly saying, don't be buttheads like the Telosians. Or the Ferengi. <laughs> <laughs> Because their heads look like butts, circle. Zachary. Because their heads look like butts. <laughs> yeah, I have this... They're butt heads. <laughs> I have this interesting um, memory, and I wasn't there, so I only saw it in a video of of um, Marina Sirtis calling the Ferengi butt heads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I will say, for, for all of the silliness of that, and the Telosians, their heads do look like butts. However... Uh, just on the surface, it has nothing to do with uh, with philosophy. Uh, and I've said this before, I, I believe, on the podcast. I, I can remember as a boy watching the original series in reruns, of course, in the early 1970s. I remember watching this, and for all of the criticisms of the production values of Star Trek, watching the veins in their heads pulsate as they... Uh, recall and think and and draw conclusions. I was I just marveled at the special effects and how real at the time the Telosians seemed to me. And even now, when I go back and I watch it, it's I mentioned SG One earlier. It's much the same way I see uh, the character Thor in SG One. Uh, it's it's clear that. Uh, you know, the production value is questionable. However, uh, the, the character and the writing of the character, and I, I give props to the special effects 
uh, people who who dreamed up those mechanisms to make those heads actually uh, function and pulsate. I, I I give them props because uh, they they really gave us something visually stunning, and they gave us a story that I think today is just as relevant as it was uh, when it w- was offered up. And I'm so very glad uh, that Gene was able to save this from uh, from the the uh, landfill and use the footage uh, in the original series. And I think it drove the desire to um, to go back and explore this original pilot. And I think the fact that we got a Christopher Pike in the latest iteration of Star Trek on the big screen, and we're about to get Christopher Pike on the latest iteration of Star Trek on the small screen. I think it speaks to the enduring nature of this story and these characters, and I'm so glad we had this conversation. <clears throat> And I think equally you could characterize the cage as being relevant today because we live today in a world that is fairly materialistic. Um, any kind of pleasure you want in life, you can manifest for yourself. There's a way to find it. Jump on the internet, you'll find it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? You can you can have pretty much whatever you want without too much effort. You know that kind of um, Telosian zoo effect is is rampant in in the culture today, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying pleasure is a bad thing, right. but I, this episode rightly says that there's more to life than those things. If if you're just seeking out those things and not challenging yourself and not striving and not trying to be the best version of yourself, you're missing something important about about in life personally, but also for humanity, right? The human race will get stuck and stagnant and not go anywhere if that's the level we're all functioning on. Um, This episode doesn't say those things very explicitly, but it kind of has faith that viewers will get the message. And maybe that's the aspect of this episode that's too cerebral. This episode seems to have faith that the average viewer will pick up on that fairly subtle message about the nature of pleasure and human satisfaction. It doesn't say it very explicitly, but I think it's an important message that people need to hear today. You know, I, I know so many people that have such uh, limited ambitions for their lives in terms of what, what what they want to accomplish, what they want to do, what they want to achieve. You know, they're content to be happy. And I honestly, at this point in life, being 40 years old, can't decide, do I envy those people because of their simplistic view of happiness, their ability to make themselves seemingly happy through fairly simplistic means? Or do I pity them because they're not challenging themselves? I go back and forth at, uh, about that at, at this age, but I do think we live in a culture where people are content to be happy, not striving to be the best versions of themselves. And I fail at that all the time, and I know you do too. I know you do. <laughs> but... Um, I think we've we've sort of culturally lost the virtue of challenging ourselves in favor of something more like being in our own personal Telosian zoos. I think within this episode, I, I think there are a few messages. First of all, I, I think it tells us we haven't talked at all about Spock in this episode. Uh, really, the only character from the original pilot that endured uh, to the Star Trek that we uh, that we all love today, but. Uh, I, I, th- I think Spock actually gives us a very important message. I mean, my goodness, Zachary, in this episode, Spock smiles. He's looking around. He's he's appreciating the the floral, uh, the the singing flowers, and he smiles. You know, he he takes pleasure in what he sees. But unlike Captain Pike, he didn't become enslaved uh, by his, by his own desire for pleasure. Uh, so I think there's a commentary there, you know, be, be a Spock, don't be a Captain Pike and become enslaved by your fantasies and certainly don't become a butthead like the Telosians. <laughs> well said, Mike. Well said. It's interesting to imagine what a, a rewrite of this episode would be with Spock as the uh, protagonist being, um, uh, captured and, and constrained inside the Telosian zoo. It would be very... <laughs> It would be a very different episode, you know, give Spock everything he's ever wanted rather than give Captain Pike everything he's ever wanted. Yeah. And, and honestly, I think that would be I think that would be a fascinating, you know, I'm sure we've got a, a you know, a fanfic writer out there somewhere uh, 
uh, that, that could probably come up with that. And, and if you do, uh, please uh, go to the Babel conference and send us a message and tell us about it. I'd, I'd love to hear that story. But I, I think you're onto something there, Zach. I would encourage you to, <laughs> to go write some fanfic about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Zachary, it's been fun talking about the cage today, but this isn't the only thing that we've been discussing here on the network. So here's a quick look at some other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM. To the journey! I love that Barkley says he's lost himself in Voyager because I have been there, man. Haven't we all, Reg? Haven't we all? It hits a little close to home. It does. I'm a little bit like Barkley in some ways. I, you know, I have just a little bit of paranoia to me. Awkward? No, a little paranoid. No, I don't think I'm awkward. No. <laughs> okay, maybe, a, maybe a little bit. <laughs> well, you said you're like Barkley. Awkward. Give me a glass of wine and I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> Sent the hall. Excuse me. Sent the hall. The six oh two club. Well, and I think that uh, there's even you know a a kernel of that conversation uh, reflected in when he is on. Uh, the, the airship with his dad and it's very interesting because Indy gives you know they give the, the two versions of the story where you know you were distant you didn't hang out with me you didn't do these things I didn't have a normal dad like every other kid and then you hear uh, you know Henry Jones Sr. say I never told you to wash behind your ears I never checked up on your homework I gave you all of the freedom and independence that you wanted and if you were to ask any kid, they'd say that's what they wanted. And then you find out, to speak to the point about fact and truth, that that's not necessarily what you want. You want involvement. You want connection. You want to be together. You want to be part of your family unit. And you want it to be cohesive. I mean, you know, at a, at a baseline, that's what everybody wants. Earl Grey. And especially, like, toward the end, when it's like, Jean-Luc, what are you and I doing just like voyaging around the galaxy by ourselves on this ship? <laughs> like it makes perfect sense to you, but it makes no sense to me, yeah. right? Just the two of us like on this giant ship. It's well, like, when wow. it was just a small skeletal crew, you know, and she's still questioning, he's like, why do we have all of these rooms and quarters? And, and then Data just nonchalantly, well, we have... You know, we need uh, evacuation and we take diplomats around. Yeah. And like he's listing it like, well, duh, this is why we have it. And Picard's like, that'll be enough data. Warp five. Well, you remember it was like when it was 42. You weren't very reasonable then, were you? Uh, no, I was not. Exactly. I was absolutely not. I was yelling at a tree in my backyard. It was <laughs> not a pretty sight. All I know is... All I know, Big Men in Heat is not a good idea. Oh, that sounds like a great band. <laughs> and that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, or the desktop app iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please, we encourage you to leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and in most third-party podcast apps. And you can also stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there's many ways for you to mind meld with us. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners-only group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the contact form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose Message to a Trek FM Show and select Metatrex. That'll come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. Well, Zachary, when you're not living out your fantasy of rescuing the princess, where can people find you around the network and on the interweb? You know me too well. <laughs> Well, you can find me elsewhere on Trek.fm as co-host of To The Journey, Trek FM show dedicated to all things Star Trek Voyager. 
You can always find me in the Babel Conference if you'd like to talk about Star Trek and philosophy with me in there. And you're welcome to follow me on Twitter. My handle is just my name, at Zachary Fruling. That's Zachary, Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, Fruling, F-R-U-H-L-I-N-G. And how about you, Mike? When you're not recuperating from your Faustian vacations, where can our listeners find you on the interwebs and around the Trek FM network? Well, when I'm not dealing with the devil, Zachary, you can find me on Facebook. That's where I'm most active. You can also catch me over on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at cmichael1701. I'm occasionally on Instagram. That's cmichael1701 as well. Don't you mean doing a deal with that devil man, Spock? (laughs) The Devil Man, Spock, for sure, for sure. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. We have lots of perks for our Patreons. Uh, Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and many, many more, all available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It does require a great deal of time and latinum to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you can find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. Well, Zachary, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the rest of the Metatrex team from around the network. Specifically, we'd like to thank C. Brian Jones, founder and publisher of Trek FM, and one of the greatest streamers I know. Executive producers Matthew Rushing and Ken Tripp, Aaron Harvey, our art director, Richard Marquez, production manager, our Patreon manager, Brandon Shea Mutala. We'd also like to give a special thanks and a shout out to our associate producers here on Metatrex. They are Patrick Devlin. Patrick's Twitter handle is at MagicDrop5. Kay Shaw, her Twitter handle is at Choco Weeble. Norman Lau, you can connect with him on Twitter at Starfighter1701. And Mark Walker, who is no longer from Parts Unknown, you can connect with him on Twitter at Mark74656. And Zachary, once more, we'd like to invite our listeners to discover more about our sponsor, Enterprise in Space, a project of the nonprofit National Space Society. Visit enterpriseinspace.org to find out more and to get your seat on the mission. And check out audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for your desktop or mobile device. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash shrekfm. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to Metatrex, a Star Trek and philosophy podcast. Until next time, when we will once again boldly go where no philosophers have gone before. <laughs>